everybody. I'm Brian Mallow, and this is But Seriously uh, with Brian Mallow, because I'm here. But really, today we're going to be with um, a friend of mine who's an entomologist and science writer. Um, like many scientists I know, after she got her PhD and worked in research a while, she segued into science communication, and we'll ask her all about that. Um, we're going to mostly talk about ants and some other insects, but as I said, she's a science communicator and she's written books on a bunch of other subjects, so uh, it'll be a sort of free-range conversation with Dr. Eleanor Spicer-Rice, who you'll meet in just a moment. I, I love insects. Uh, if you don't already know this about me, I, I love insects. I love insect photography, by which, of course, I mean photographs taken by insects, obviously. Um, from the first time I got a camera with a macro lens, I started looking for small things to shoot, and I started shooting flowers, and then often there were insects on the flowers. So I ended up becoming really interested in insects. And uh, luckily, I know a lot of photographers and entomologists who've nurtured me along the way. And I really look forward to this conversation. I. I'll tell you where I am in my life in terms of, I'm, I, I wouldn't claim to be a Buddhist or anything, but for the most part, when insects violate <laughs> the sanctity of my home, I don't feel that way at all about it, but, but let's just go for it. When they do, um, for the most part, I'll either leave them be now or I'll remove them non-lethally with a couple exceptions. The major, now first of all, it, obviously mosquitoes are a major exception. If they, they draw first blood. If they attack me, they, mosquitoes have to die. I'm sorry. And I know all mosquitoes don't sting, but if you land on me and you look like a mosquito, if you're even just another kind of fly that resembles a mosquito, those ones with the floofy, maybe Eleanor can tell me what those are. I don't have a photo, but there are some little flies that unfortunately resemble insects. They have to die too. I'm sorry. It's not my fault. And, or maybe it is, but um, ants, I'm very conflicted about ants, um, but mosquitoes and roaches. Roaches, I don't know if they're harmful. All I know is that all creatures fear and despise cockroaches. Um, humans really hate them. I think everyone hates them, all species, because we know that they're gonna, they're gonna replace us, that they're gonna survive and we're not going to, and we hate them even more because it's gonna be our own fault. It's gonna be our own fault, and that's why we hate them. Uh, roaches are gross. I don't even know why. I love beetles and the beetles, but I love beetles and some be roaches kind of look like beetles uh, and yet hatred there, love for the beetle. I don't know why. Ants are where I'm most conflicted because ants are amazing little machines and we're going to learn more about them today. But the problem is when they come in the house, they don't just come in one or two at a time. They feel like they have to tell all of their friends. They come in by the hundred, and that's, that's, that's not going to work. Spiders. I got to say that I'm not entirely comfortable with spiders in terms of pick. A lot of bugs I'm happy to pick up, even a big praying mantis. I love handling them, even though they can actually hurt you a little bit. Um, either like they can, they can bite, but, but, but they have like sharp uh, things on their on here, on their arms. But I'm not afraid of them. Spiders still, I'm a little uneasy picking them up, but I don't like to kill them. If they're up in a corner up high, I'll just live and let live. They can stay up there. I don't care. How long do they even live? They're catching other bugs. They can stay. If I find them down lower, I scoop them up with a piece of paper and I toss them outside. And I figure I'm doing them a favor. How much is there to eat in my bathtub? Probably not very much. But every time I do it, when I eject one and I close the door, in my imagination, <laughs> in my imagination, it is instantly eaten by some predator. <laughs> like, sorry, like I think I'm doing it a, fa a favor, but there's about a 50-50 shot that as soon as it's out there, it was safe inside and it's, it's doomed once it gets out there. So spiders, I have this, I, I, I don't necessarily want to touch them, but I scoop them up and I'll get them outside. I even get rid of flies sometimes with a, cup and uh 
Because I don't want to kill him. I feel like every little creature, like I said, I'm not quite a Buddhist, but there's a part of me that feels like I'm just a unique roll of the genetic dice, and so is that little ant. And doesn't it have almost as much of a right? <laughs> almost. I can't even say it. Doesn't it have as much a right to exist as I do? We are each just individuals. Um, maybe ants are less individualistic, but still, it just doesn't seem right. And the problem is if you have a pet, like a cat, th sometimes I've woken up in the morning and the cat food bowl was just covered with literally 100 ants. I used to try to build a moat like I would put a big dinner plate and then fill it with water and put the cat food bowl in the middle and then there's a moat that the ants can't get to. Um, but whenever the cat eats the food, it sort of pushes the bowl to the side and the moat is breached and the next morning there's a hundred ants in the cat food and they have to go and I feel like a mass murderer. They made me kill them and it's not my fault. I hate, that's not fair. I've gone so much hand-to-hand -hand battle with ants, and they have six hands. They have a little advantage. I have a height advantage, but anyway, all of this makes me think about ant behavior and, and ants, and so I thought that we should bring on someone who's an old friend and also um, someone who spent a lot of time studying ants. There she is. Ba-boom, Dr. Eleanor Spicer-Rice. Hi, Eleanor. Hey, Brian. It's so good to see you. So um, bad to hear what you're doing, but so good to see you. It's bad to hear. <laughs> All right. Well, jump into it. What's the first thing? Why don't you just tell me what's the first thing before we even introduce you? What's the first thing that you want to respond to in that, in what I just said? I wish I could have made a list, Brian. I mean, let's talk about your spider problem first, because, you know, I feel like as soon as you put them out, many spiders have throughout their lives, which can last years and or decades. And spiders can, never, can live decades? Yes. And they've never seen the outdoors. They don't know what to do out there. Many species have evolved with you to live in your house. So when you throw them outside, they're like, oh, come on now. And then they just kind of wait for you to open your door so they can walk back inside your house and go back to what they were doing, which was keeping your ecosystem inside your house running. But hold on, that's Brian. a remarkable thing you just said, because you we like to think that like even us, like all creatures are adapted to live outside. There was no inside. I mean, there were caves and things, but until we started building buildings, there was no inside. So, but you're saying since then. Since then, it's been a few years, it's been a minute, they have preferred, as we do, to live inside and to eat all of our junk inside our house. And, you know, we have a lot of junk in our, side, our house, right? Like they did study around here where you and I live, and they found the average person has at least 100 different species of right. arthropods living in our house. There's so much for us to so, talk about. Like I noticed that you're referring to a citizen science project that Rob Dunn and people at NC State and the North Carolina Dunn. Museum of Natural yeah. Sciences um, yeah, and so our, our friend Michelle Troutwine and Matt, Ber Matt Michelle. Bertone. Matt, yeah. I'm gonna, Michelle will be on soon and Matt will be on next week. But- You got some lucky viewers. Arthropods in our homes. So you know what, let me pull this up. Like um, you're the author of of several books, and right. this is Dr. Eleanor's book of, of Common Ants, and it's co-written, it says, with Rob Dunn. Rob Dunn. Or, so you know what's interesting about that book is that when we started to write it, we wanted just to know, you know, what are the most common ants that are living around us? That should be an easy thing, right? It should be like a, a Google search. Some researchers put it down. And at the time, we had no idea what the most common species, we as a people, we as a species, we just didn't know what the most common ants that lived around us were here. We just didn't have any record of it. So Rob's lab with Andrea Lucky, who's there, and now she's, she's down in Florida, they sent out a call to people to just mail in their ants. And mail that's how we found ants. out what the most common species of ants were. Yeah, they had get a little cookie and put it on a note card and put it out. And when the ants came to the note card, they mailed them in. And that's how they found out which species were most common. Because we didn't know. 
That's amazing. So before we move on, and I haven't even given you a, a nice, really official, uh, you are Dr. Eleanor Spicer Rice, and you did your PhD, you studied entomology, and your focus was I ants. ants. Mm -hmm. And you studied ants. Um, and then we'll catch up since then. But you know what? A bunch of comments came in, and let's 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 see what they look like. Um, let's see if I can figure out how to do this again. Uh, Brian Russell said, "Woot!" First in chat. Well hey, done, hey, Brian. Brian Russell. Um, and then I don't. Let's see how this is going to work. Oh, it's the whole thing showed. Fred Bothwell, I think, coming from Texas. Brian is right here in North Carolina. Mosquitoes kill at least. 725,000 persons every year, whereas snakes it, kill a, a tenth, less than a tenth, and sharks only Mosquitoes are yeah. the deadliest creature on the planet. They kill yeah. almost a million people every year, at least 725,000. You know who I'm You're also, right, Frederick. You're right, Fred. And you know what? Um, we will be talking about sharks, but we're going to wait until May when David Schiffman's first book comes out, Why Sharks Matter, and that's his Twitter handle. That's great. Um, That'll be a great book. Uh, we will be talking about why sharks matter and and a bunch of, of, of myths like that. Build a giant ant farm between Texas and Mexico. Fred, you sent a lot of comments. We might not be able to read every one of them. Oh, here's something. Yeah. Parapanera clavada is a species of ant. Oh, the bullet yeah. ant. Yeah, the bullet ant. That's supposed to be the most painful sting of all ant species. It's supposed to be very painful. And, and so. I came from Texas. I was born in Chicago, but raised in Texas. And we had fire ants. We do, too. You do. We do here yes. in North Carolina. Yeah. We you know do that, in North Carolina, the south. of. I got to say that I don't States. encounter ants nearly as much as I did when I was a child. <laughs> now, an entomologist, <laughs> that might be different for I an entomologist. But... The closer you are to the ground physically, yeah. the more likely you are to encounter them. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um a giant beehive, Fred. Um, how about the Asian giant hornet? Oh, it could devastate bees. Hornet. So, don't worry about it. Don't worry. Don't worry about, about it. it. No, we've got other problems in this world. And honeybee colonies, probably a billion. Lots of, yeah, lots of bees. So, thank you, Fred, mm -hmm. and thank you, Brian, for for tuning in and commenting. All those seems to have come from, oh, Brian came from YouTube, I can see. So I'm intrigued, but, you know, I get caught up in some of the tech. But um, Eleanor, why don't we, I'm going to ask you about some other subjects you've written about, but we're going to start with talking about ants. But before we dive okay. into ants, tell me a little bit about your, let, let's do a little background to catch us up to here. First of all. Wait, where are you from? Are you from North Carolina? I'm from North Carolina. I'm from a small city in eastern North Carolina called Goldsboro. And did you always know you wanted to be a scientist? I didn't know that I always, I didn't always know I wanted to be a scientist. But where I'm from, and if I think many people who are watching this who are from small towns probably know that the job range when you're little doesn't isn't as big you know you have people who keep small towns running so you if the scientists teach science or they're like doctors or veterinarians so i didn't know there was anything called entomology when i was little i just knew that bugs were amazing and i loved them did you know there was a thing called etymology <laughs> i didn't but my dad told people for a long time that i was an etymologist so. <laughs> i always have, i had this idea for like a funny like dinner conversation where someone says like, oh, um, uh, like David is uh, an etymologist. And then someone goes, oh, you study insects? And they go, no, uh, words actually. And, that, and then they go, oh, well, you would know. <laughs> you know, it's kind of cute. Yeah, so, you just have to get the exact right people to come to your dinner. Exactly. You to make this happen. Yeah, hey, I think ever since I moved to Raleigh and I worked at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, I I have gotten to hang around with a lot of the the right people. But the past two years, I'm trying to remember. You and I met for lunch. It was probably a year ago, but it was during the pandemic, wasn't it? That we decided. Did we it, meet during COVID? Was it right before? I don't think COVID? we did. Probably yeah, not, because at the I beginning, was very very no, I was locked down. The place that we met closed down. During, because of okay. 
So mm -hmm. it isn't it our perception of time has changed so much. Like for me to say, it's was that changed. a year ago or was that like three years ago? BC is now before COVID. It's yeah. like BCE and then there's BC. Yeah. Yeah. Before the so, COVID era. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, okay. So you didn't always know, but were you interested? Tell me about your path into entomology and then, and then out of it, essentially. Okay. Uh, well, I, I love to read growing up. I, being in a small town, one of the great things is you have a lot of time to do stuff. So you have a lot of time to stare at bugs and you have a lot of time to read if you like reading. And so I liked books and I liked um, entomology. And when I got to college at North Carolina State University, I found out that there is such a thing as entomology. So I started taking every class I could find. I got a job in a lab. I got a job in this place that was basically a cafeteria that feeds insects and rears them. And I got a job at the Science Museum downtown and just did everything I could to learn more about insects. And then I went to my master's degree and got a PhD um, studying insects. And it's thrilling if you love bugs that you can spend so much time learning about them. And, and bugs also, insects, are so important to our daily lives that if they touch everything that we do. So it's wonderful. That's why we me. have to wash everything. Yes. <laughs> That's right. I want you to elaborate stuff. on that. Why about how important bugs are? Well, let's talk about ants, for example. Let's talk about I mean, and, and what was your thesis about? Maybe first before we move on to that, when what was your PhD about what research about? My PhD research studied these two invasive ant species that are here. Um, you can find some of one of them, the Argentine ant um, in the Mediterranean. Now they they have a colony that spans more than a thousand miles over there. Um, there's one that's uh, two colonies. They cut the Argentine ants are these teeny tiny ants. They don't have stingers. Um, but they can totally take over when they move into an area. So there's like two super colonies that are battling it out uh, in California. And we have a couple of super colonies here. A super colony is a colony that just gets crazy big. Um, and then when they do, they can like wipe out native species. They eat all of our stuff. They change the way the habitat works and stuff like that. So I studied the Argentine ant and then a newer invasive species called the Asian needle ant. And the Asian needle ant is bigger. It's not, doesn't have the colony, complex colony structure. Um, I don't know the best word for it. It's more primitive than the, the Argentine ant, but they're wiping out Argentine ants when they came in. So I um, examined how this was happening. And when I was studying them, I couldn't really find that many Asian needle ants around. And now I can't not find them. They oh, have wow. expanded and they're just everywhere now. So, and it's, they're dangerous. I mean, two to four times as many people are allergic to their venom as are to honeybee venom. So people are getting stung and not realizing what's stinging them because they're sneaky. You know, you had fire ants growing up. You know when a fire ant has gotten a hold of you because many other fire ants are there. They just go nuts. They, you know, you see them. I mean, they're just crazy. Yeah. But Asian needle ants aren't stinging. They sting defensively and you can't really see them and you might sit down on the grass and they might sting you to get away and you stand up and you don't see that anything happened to you. And so people are getting stung a lot and having these anaphylactic reactions and having no idea what, what hit them. And this and is so, an ant that like, it doesn't have natural predators. Like did it move in? That's the thing of often with invasive, invasive species that they move into a new area where they're not as, we have Hunted? no idea, no idea why this ant is getting to be so prevalent around here. We just, we just don't know. It's had, we've had records of it in the United States since the 1920s, but about 10 years ago, their populations just started taking off and we don't know what the switch was. We don't know what changed. Maybe something was removed from the environment that we weren't watching. Maybe yeah, maybe they had a predator that was removed. Maybe warming temperatures has helped them to, you know, have more of a season. So their populations either. We we just don't know. But they're here. Interesting. So we got to you know, get into it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to tease everybody. And, and, and uh, we're going to have some beautiful ant imagery. So 
Um, let me let me just uh, click over here a second and 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 show you. So um, this is one of Eleanor's uh, books that's available. This wherever. one tells you about the most common ants living around you, and it's written more for like a young adult audience, but it can get anybody acquainted with who's living in their backyard in the United States. Yeah, and then, but then you also have Dr. Eleanor's book of common ants of New York City. Sticking with the theme here, yeah. <laughs> I mean, how different is that? And there are lots of ant species in New York City. Yeah, different ones. So this ones, one's just more ones. localized. Yeah, there are different ones um, that are in New York that you see more often than you would blanket over the whole country because New York is a totally different environment. I mean, um, and we'll see when we look at ant pictures. Hmm? New York isn't that far from here. Now, I say that as a species that uses air travel and automobiles, although ants can sometimes catch a ride, and I guess it's a long way to go on your little legs. But but New York to North Carolina isn't really that far for species to move, right? Uh, not in the car, but, you know, ants have to deal with a lot of things that we wouldn't have to deal with, like climate. They don't really have, like, a climate control for the, for the outside, so... Um, their season, field seasons are shorter. They depend on a lot of plant species that could be different here than are different in New York. So it's sort of similar, but there's some yeah. species that can do a lot better up there, and there's some species that do better here. Well, um, um, that's one. And then um, we're not, today we decided we won't be talking about spiders because we're going to no. save it for a future episode. But Dr. Eleanor's Book of Common Spiders is another option. I wrote that with and, Chris Buttle, yeah. Um, you know what? Let's jump into this because is this your most recent book? That uh, This is the most recent one, yeah. And so tell me what this is. This is Ants, Workers of the World. What is this book? So this book is really Edward Nigga's book. And he is a photographer who takes really, 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 really close up pictures of ants. And so it's a large book and you can see ant faces or ant jaws, you know, or ant feet. And, and just it's, to be clear, it's beautiful. He does amazing work. And then I not... wrote an entomologist and he's not really an insect photographer by he is right he didn't start out on insects but he became fascinated with them like pretty much anybody i know who looks for a minute at insects just like you you yep. can't help but become fascinated you don't even have to be a super curious person once you start paying attention to them, they really get into your heart and, and you start to wonder what they're doing. And you realize that you will always have something to do if you like insects because they're all around you. Yeah, um, that's great. Insects are in your heart. Have insects crawled into your heart? <laughs> they crawl. Um, you look at them and they get right on in there. And then I want to say hi to Melissa, problem. who, as far as I hey, know, Melissa. is still out in California and says she didn't expect to be learning about ants this morning. This is cool. Um, thanks for tuning in. Good to see you, Melissa. Um, so let's switch over Before to Before you this. look at this, can we talk about this book real quick? Yeah, And please. ants in general. That one thing that's important to know, we, which we started talking about, is that without ants, our worlds would stop, right? So ants operate at every single level of that food web. And they also do other things, like they turn more soil than earthworms do in a lot of places. And they help recycle nutrients and keep soil healthy. They help keep pest populations in check. They will eat pests. They're everywhere. Um, ants, you know, outnumber people by 10, something like 10,001 or something, or by the most conservative estimates. They're, they're everywhere you look. They are everywhere. And they're doing something where they are. So they're really important to keep and not just to keep but to keep the ones that we have for our environment because they are the ones that are doing the stuff you know that's meant to be here if they found that if you just take one ant species out or a few ant species out of a place the whole environment starts to kind of have this cascading effect around it where things start to collapse because they're all doing really important jobs where they are they plant seeds um they uh help keep invasive species out um so anyway 
that's all I wanted to Excellent. Well, we're going to go the, way the really more. And here's, here's a question from Brian. Is there an easy way to ID the Asian needle ant? I ask because we yeah. try to avoid ant mounds on dog walks. That's a really great question, Brian. And there are some easy ways to ID them. One is that they don't build mounds. So that's why they're so sneaky. They could nest under your doormat. They could nest under an acorn cap. They can have really, really tiny nests. An Asian needle ant is black and shiny, and it's a medium, it's smaller than a carpenter ant, those big carpenter ants you see in your house, but it's bigger than a sugar ant that you have in your house. One way that people identify them is, oh, and they also, they their legs look kind of orangish when they're running around. You have to get really close. Yeah. And they move in a smooth, uh, a smooth way. Some ants move in like a halting kind of way. These ants are real kind of smooth. And they like leaf litter. They like mulch. Um, they don't necessarily like being on your dog walk area. But but ant mounds that do like um, fire ants, they are the ones that have those bigger mounds. Um, and one way that people identify them, which I don't know if this is easy, is they can't stick to glass. So if you're curious and you want to be sort of sure, their little feet don't stick to the glass. So people will scoop them up and, and dump one in a, a jar. And it can't climb up the side of the jar like a lot of ant species can. They're terrible climbers. Okay. But they're long and black and thin, and they walk close to the ground. Excellent, and thank you. Uh... <laughs> um, Fred asks, who are the ants of the scientist? Um, he also asked, you know, let's just, <laughs> on the note of silliness, do you know if scientists breed new species of insect? Is there anything to say about that? Um. Well, it's kind of tricky to breed a whole new species. We right. find new species all the time that come from just living in certain areas. And there are a lot of times that we find, now that our molecular techniques are so good, we're finding out that a lot of things that we thought were the same species have turned out to be a bunch of different species. Well, let us... <gasps> let's. This is let's one talk... of Eddie's photographs. Yeah, so Eddie is Edward Florin Nigga, and he's uh, mm -hmm. Eddie Ed 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 Dimage. You can see his dot uh, com, his website right there. It's hard. I don't know how he pronounces. It's like Eddie Maj or Ed Image. Um, I like Eddie Maj. That sounds real fancy. Yeah. So the book is his photos, and you wrote the text. Right. Yeah. And so I got to the... see what he did and say what it was. So one of the things uh, that what we're going to look at first is a series of ant portraits. Um, right. So what are, what are we looking at here? Well, one thing we're looking at, before I tell you what it is, is a portrait of an ant. And so what I want people to see is that these are their faces. Like we think about ants as red ants or black ants or, you know, picnic ants or whatever. And we don't think about how different they actually are from each other. The ants that are eating your cat food are probably not the ants that are up in your upstairs bathroom, like drinking the water from the sink. They're totally different species and they're doing totally different things. And so if you take a minute to watch them, you'll see that they're incredible. And if you look at the shape of their face or what they look like in general, you can get a clue as to the way they live their lives. So this ant is an ant that's called Cephalodes. And what they do is they can fly. They're like Superman ants. And they see their little the little things on the, her little head there. And I yeah. say her because most of the ants that you see are females. Male ants usually don't look at all like female ants. They just mate and get kicked out. So this is um, one that flies. And those, those little things help her to steer in the air. They can't really fly but what they do is they stick their little legs out and they can glide between trees and they can um it's really cool this isn't really this isn't, so wait like, they don't yeah. really have wings but, no they don't have but, wings they have these little swoopy features that help them to glide they're gliding ants that's kind of amazing you know it's hard to understand how some research is done like how we even learn about some things when they're small and in the wild like how, yeah. you know what I mean? It's, it's very challenging you to learn You film stuff them. It. You film them and then you slow it down so you can see it. Yes. And first of all, you're like, is it that line? You know. So, ants, and then, do you know any general stuff about, so like I noticed that we're going to look at these portraits and these are just the faces, not to mention how their bodies might differ, but their faces, 
they're so different and there's right. so many kinds. So there's many lineages of ants. Right. Ants are pretty old evolutionarily. They're very old. Yeah. They're, they were here before the dinosaurs. Before the dinosaurs. Like yes. similar, are there, sim, are there ants that survive today that are kind of similar to ants that are that yes. old? Like, are they, like sharks right. famously are large, you know, some things from the time of the dinosaurs, we've changed amazingly from some little, from some little right. rodent, from some little small mammal to us. Whereas right. apparently sharks for hundreds of millions of years have large, they're not unchanged, but I guess evolution finds something that works and it sticks with it and ants are that right. old. They're, the ants are very old and their social structure has changed some and it's gotten more complicated for some species. For ants like the Asian needle ant that we were talking about earlier, they don't do things that ants that uh, appeared later do. They don't have trail pheromones that we know of. You know, you see the ants on your cat food follow each other into your kitchen because they're smelling a trail pheromone. But the more the earlier ants don't do that. So they what they do is um, this particular species will if they find something good to eat and they can't bring it back by themselves, they'll go home, they'll tap their sisters on their head with their antennae and the sisters will fold up like their pupae and they'll tuck their sisters under their bodies, carry them to the food, plop them on it, and they'll gather the food and come back. But they don't have that trail pheromone that, that showed up later. Their queens don't particularly look like these big fat mamas that have all these eggs inside. You know, they can they don't really have a clearly defined thing like that. But but yeah, so these these sorts of things appear later. But a lot of ants look very similar. Species look very similar to ants from a long time ago, and we know that we because we find them in amber and in fossils. And um. We had a question. Let me find this. Um, because it was about pheromones. And so it's interesting uh, how we learned about... Where is it? Ah, here it is. Um, how do pheromones affect insects and human beings? And do you know, didn't Edward O. Wilson who passed away just earlier, not, not too long ago, uh, not earlier today, but not too long ago, um, had something to do with figuring out this chemical language that, that ants use? He did. He did a lot of work on the chemical language of ants. He, he saw like how they, their smell changed when they died and stuff like that. And how pheromones affect, chem so pheromones are chemicals that an animal or an insect will put out that another one can detect and it can convey information. So people have pheromones. We have sex pheromones. We have, you can smell your mother even if, and know what she smells like, even if you don't realize that you are smelling your mother. Like you mm. could, we, we just have our own smells. Even if you don't like your mother you, you, or you love your mother, this is all very ancient and in, inside of us. These are our pheromones. You, you can smell your partner, um, whether or not you realize that you're smelling your partner, whether or not they wear, you know, anything, any like deodorant or anything. Okay. So we have our own pheromones. And what's great about this chemical language is that chemicals, sounds that I can make are finite, right? We, I can only make a certain range of sounds and a certain amount of loud, you know, sounds, but chemicals are pretty much infinite and they can be extremely specific and they can be silent. So a uh, ant can make a chemical that only ants of her species can smell, right? And we can't tell that they're there. So they don't affect us at all. We don't see that trail that they made. We don't smell it. And so it's pretty wonderful. And you think about moths with their sex pheromones that they sit up on those our lights at night and they just wave their wings over their scent organs and they, they let their smell go out. And only those male moths of that species can smell it. You know, we have, it's so beautiful to think about talking through chemicals, to me anyway. You know, there's a spider called the bolus spider. And what it does is it's able, it has cracked the moth mating scent code 
for this species of moth. So what it does is it produces that chemical and puts it on a, a ball, a sticky ball of silk, and then it'll wave it around in a circle, like a, you know, I don't know what those things are called, but the, the ball in a circle. And then the male moths will come to mate with it and get stuck on it. And the boa spider will reel it in like it's fishing and eat it. So, you know, there are a number of species that can crack that code. And it's so cool to me that they can do it. And some ants will crack other ant species code and they will follow them to their um, food. So they don't even make their own trail pheromone. They just wait around for the other ants to find it. And then they'll all follow that species uh, pheromone to food. Yeah, It's really wonderful. And ants languages are so complicated and they produce so many pheromones. But anyway, this is the, this is a gliding ant. Um, and That's they're really amazing. Pretty. And mm -hmm. uh, we have here's just another one. cool ant. He's got portrait. a big old, big old head. He's got it. That almost reminds me of that. It's that that alien in in one of the Star Wars films. That it's really derived from a different insect, like a kind of a, a thorny phasmid. Isn't it funny how once you start learning the insect species, you see how many aliens were stolen from insects? Yeah. <laughs> There's so there many aliens that we see all the time. When we try to imagine what aliens would look like, sometimes, well, first of all, there's all there's the restraints of like a sci-fi TV show like Star Trek with a limited costume department, so the aliens yeah. look pretty human, but maybe a weird forehead or yeah, or got, I've got a ears. lot of wrinkles in my forehead. I'm but even when brain. you have all the digital effects, our imagination's a little limited when you consider. Just here on Earth, the variety is astounding. When you look at deep sea creatures or zoom in on insects or even microscopic like mites yeah. and, and uh, uh, tardigrades and things, like you go, there's just, what alien thing is this? And we even have other <laughs> senses. Like, like you try to imagine, I feel like we can't even imagine some aliens might have some senses that we haven't even imagined because even here right. on Earth, we don't all share the same sensory apparatus. And so right. some creatures can detect magnetic fields or electric fields, and some can right. see into the ultraviolet or infrared. You know, that's a very human-centric term. <laughs> yeah, for us. But isn't that amazing? Yeah. Like, just what's here on Earth, a jellyfish, what a weird, an octopus, what a weird creature. I don't understand jellyfish at all. I do not understand them. I can understand the words that people write about jellyfish, but actually jellyfish make no sense to me whatsoever. No, it's like, Nothing what are about they made of? They're not even made of living what? flesh. They're made how? of some... How? <laughs> I don't understand how. <laughs> how is out that a there. thing? They're out there and they're just doing stuff and, and they don't even care, you know? Yeah. And they move in the creepiest possible way. They're in no hurry. Jellyfish are in absolutely no hurry, but they still find you. You yeah, know? they just, they, you know what? When I was a kid, I had an unfortunate encounter. I was maybe seven to 10 years old and we lived in Houston, but we were visiting the beach, uh, Corpus Christi. And I know it was a Sunday. I'll tell you why in a minute. I walked out into the water and I saw what looked like a really pretty balloon with little colored oh, streamers. No. So I mm -hmm. went to reach for it. Before I reached for it, it reached for it, me. And it got you. I, all of a sudden, before I could get it, it, I felt horrible pain all over my legs and stuff. I ran crying. Oh. We drove up and down the beach. Here's how I know it was Sunday because we couldn't, there were first aid stations and they were all closed, but we found one that was open. And you know what? It was almost like picking someone out of a lineup. They showed me some pictures and I picked mm -hmm. the uh, Portuguese man of war is what I saw. Oh. And I guess that could have even been worse for me um, besides just being covered with calamine yeah. lotion. Yeah. Nobody peed on you? Nobody even offered. Um, oh. <laughs> terrible. Uh, here we have a comment from Melissa. The nerd energy is strong and infectious. Now I must know everything about jellyfish. I know. You know what? When you I'm have learn, to... Melissa, call me, please. Just Do you... kill me. Let me know if you, you know what, and this goes out to any listeners, um, viewers, which by the way, if you're listening only on audio, we are going to show some pictures, but we'll make sure to give you vivid descriptions. Um, but better stop just saying it looks pop cool. over to YouTube if you want to see or uh, 
the the video or version. Or just buy the book. Or just buy the book. <laughs> um, exactly. Where is it? Ants, it workers is. of the world. So yeah. you know what? Um, where was I going with that? That uh, you were jellyfish. If you, this is always going to be the case. Obviously, now I need a jellyfish expert. So if anyone knows one, or I'll just go looking for one. But let's go back. I feel um, like it's like chasing a rainbow there, you know? I know. Rainbows, I what like... a great topic. I need an expert. Oh, God. Okay, so look at you this know, Okay, this is really cool. This is, this is a driver ant. This is from um, Africa. So these are like those ones that are never in one place at any time. They don't have a nest. So we were just talking about how pheromones are useful chemicals, right? Look at the driver ant. You can't see any eyes on it. It doesn't need eyes. It's in constant contact with its nest mate through, her, with, through chemicals, through chemical cues. And they just tumble over the earth from place to place, you know, gathering food. They don't build nests. They just come. And they say when the driver ants are coming, you can, you can hear them coming because the everybody gets disrupted because they will eat anything in their path. Um, is that, and then there are a lot of, oh, go ahead. They're driver ants. Is that, I have a memory growing up as a kid. It seemed like this was something you would see in some movies or something right. where uh, 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 just an army of ants. And I thought, is our, I thought they were like army ants. Is that something or, or is oh, it yeah, these that, that if they're South coming, America. you have to empty out your okay. village because. The next picture is army ant. Yeah. So they, they told me that driver, ant, that's, that's the army ant. That's in okay, South but... America. And so it's just the similar concept. So we can look at either one. You can see, if you go back to the army ant, you can see their eyes are really small. See how tiny are basically light receptors. And they, somebody told me who lived in Africa, they were like, when they come, we just move. And they clean everything out, and then we just go back. It's fine. But there are a lot of insects and birds and mammals that are adapted to these ants as they tumble over the earth. They scare everything up into the air, and then these birds and little creatures will come in and eat all the stuff that they're scaring. So it's this huge network of creatures that depend on these ants to move through and clear out an area because they, they live on them, they live around them. And they're really cool. And they just depend on um, their bodies and the chemicals they make to find places and to move around. So the queen is always on the move. They're always carrying their babies with them. And these, uh, the second one you showed, you see their big old mandibles. They use those to carry things around, but they also build structures out of their bodies. So they can build bridges oh, from their bodies to get across. That kind of behavior so, is cool. And, and, and for you, I mean, if you lived there and you still were trying to protect your cat food, you'd be out of luck because they would just go across the water to get to the cat food. And um, it's really neat. You know, the fire that, ants that you that have growing up of, can do that. That kind of group behavior that you're talking about where many, many ants, they do that. What's that thing that rafting? They do yeah, that rafting. Rafti fire ants do that. And then, then bridging, like bridges where you see leaf cutter ants and other, like all these ants right. where they, co that cooperative behavior, yeah, it seems and it, And it seems like they're saying, hey, let's all go build a bridge. Come on, guys. But right. that's not what they're doing. They're making individual decisions that result in this huge pattern. So, oh, the water's rising. Give me your little, you know, tar seed, you know, and then they become a raft based on individual decisions. There's not this giant brain that's telling all of them to do something. They're operating based on the, the way each of them perceives the environment. That's so, so it's really hard to cool. wrap your mind around because... Yeah, but isn't that how we are? Like if you step back and you look at people from like way far away and you see how our networks, you see our highways, you see the way trends move, you know... But but we're all we making this, our own decisions. But our brain, even though on some level it maybe it has to come down to that, I guess, that but our brain, um, we can imagine, you know, we do have some abilities that we don't think 
most other species have with 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 our knowledge of the our memory of the past and our imagination sure. of the future and so right. we can plan and then we can become we can go to school to become an architect or an engineer and then we, we can. can become part of a team and plan right build the structure like design a building and then build it and it's like how do these how does what coordinates the activity but, of dozens or but hundreds overall of each thing is operating on feedback right say you're going to go become an architect in school the time that you're going through school maybe we're in a recession and nothing's getting built so you decide to become i don't know what, what do you become in a recession a builder <laughs> no because they're not going to do anything what who, who's working you become something that people do then so fewer architects come about at that time right and you think well that was what i planned on doing all along but you're you're part of you're responding to environmental cues so there's this huge pattern overall that occurs that doesn't have so much to do with you you know yeah we don't know you're a science comedian and i'm an entomologist who writes stuff yeah now. what do we so know what, what do we know <laughs> <laughs> so that's but an amazing name I mean, oh yeah, that now yeah, that's really cool. I love those ants. That's a trap jaw ant, and they can use those jaws to snap down on food, but they can also use them to escape. And they're have, they're super super powerful. And other species of trap jaw ants are the fastest species on the planet because of the, how fast their jaws are when they close. You and know. they can use that to want what. Yeah, what? I'm definitely going to be speaking with Adrian Smith. Some of what oh. we know, and when I say we, I actually mean science, which. I don't know how I get to include myself in that, but but some Including of what we know, Adrian, yeah, Adrian yeah. contributed to, and and he right. has amazing high speed slow motion photography incredible. that has revealed incredible. where they can measure the speed of how fast they have mechanisms to stretch their jaws right. open, and then when they want snapping shut, and uh, he has amazing videos about this. So we'll right. talk to Adrian And Smith so they soon. use this to escape too, yeah. They don't just use it to grab food, they can launch themselves yeah. into the so air So that's that incredible, way. and there's yeah. many kinds of, and their trap jaws, they don't all look like that. Some of them have different shapes yeah. and. So if somebody's listening, these ants are hunters, so they have really big eyes, and so mm. they can see things. And then they have these really long, narrow jaws that look like aliens, too. And um, they use those really long, narrow jaws to catch food and to launch themselves. And you, these, these are, that was a tropical ant. This is another type of trap jaw ant we're looking at now that has shorter jaws. But we see these things and we think, well, you have to go to a rainforest to see this sort of thing. But even here in North Carolina, where I live, we have a tremendous diversity of trap jaw ants. It's just that they're really, really, really tiny and they live in the soil. So they're these very ferocious predators, but they're very, very, very small. So um, we still have them. And if you saw them, you would be amazed. They're and, beautiful. And, and as you mentioned, it's been determined that that for some of the trap jaw ants, the speed at which they snap their jaws shut is the or at least one of the fastest biological right. motions in nature. Um, yeah. and, and you just, it's like, how amazing is that? Yeah. Now, what's crazy. this? Let's, uh, I was going to say fella, but, but what's this little lady? This lady, this <laughs> lovely lady. So what we're looking at now, um, if somebody as an ant person, it looks like a run of the mill ant face. It looks like a field ant, what we call field ants, which are those bigger ants that are a little bit bigger than, um, uh, well, they're bigger than the ants in your kitchen and about the same size as the carpenter ants, those big friendly ants that you see walking around outside. But if you look closer at it, you see that it has these very large sickle shaped jaws. And that's the clue to know that you're looking at a slave making ant. Slave making ants are relatively common and they are not very good nursemaids. And some people think it's because the jaws are too sharp that they'll pierce the, um, skin of their babies, of the cuticle of their babies. I'm not sure if that's why it is or not, but they can't or don't rear their own young or take care of that type of colony. So what they do is they go to field ant nests, which look like them, but they have these gentle, sweet little anti mouths and they raid the nest all at once and they grab the pupae of the field ant and they bring them home to their own nests. So you take the pupae because you don't have to feed a pupa, right? You just emerge and you're an adult, right? So they've 
the field ants have already done all the work on those babies. So when the pupae emerge as adults, they think that they're slave maker ants and they do all of the chores for the slave maker ant colony and they rear the young and they do all of that. And if you take a slave, a pupae, an abducted field ant from that slave maker ant and you say, here, I'm releasing you back to your colony, go be free. They will fight to the death because they will <laughs> think that they are not those ants anymore. They have all of a sudden become slave maker ants in their minds because of how they smell. They have become, they have adopted the smell of the colony. And so they will think that the field ants that are actually them are their enemies and they'll fight them. So they don't want to go back to their birth family. <laughs> no, they don't want to go back to them, but they like where they are. They don't really, they just don't know. They just don't know. They, they have emerged and they're doing the jobs that they think is their job. Yes. So that is the slave maker ant. It's, it's kind of weird. Wow. So let you me test that around my here knowledge in here. North Carolina. Okay. We see these big eyes. Are those compound eyes on the sides that I see? They have. They little... are the compound eyes. They have facets on them. And then mm -hmm. many kinds of insects, in addition to their main higher resolution eyes, sometimes have these lower res. Is that what we're seeing right there? Ocelli. The... Yes. Ocelli. There's three little what is, spots which are what? in the forehead, and those help determine photo period. They help determine it, light in general. Um, the, so they're right here and right here and right here. So you can see like light, um, direction and stuff. It's really important for some species like bees, for example, who need to determine the direction of the sun and then account for that when they come back to their nest and dance to show where the, um, nectar source is. Excellent. So it's really good for these ants for orienting themselves to nests that they're stealing <laughs> stuff from. I'm not sure. This yes. is from Nadine coming to us from Lindau, Germany. Wow. Nadine. Yes, uh, one of my colleagues from the Lindau Nobel Laureate meetings, and mm -hmm. uh, that that face. I don't know which ant she's responding to or what what <laughs> fact ant fact. Um, so, let's see what else we got here. Um, ooh, oh, what is this, this is shiny? Beautiful, ant. beautiful. It's very shiny. You know, sometimes insects are shiny, and we wonder why. And with this particular ant, the answer is we don't know why. The reason it's shiny is because it has these little indentations in its cuticle. If you look at it, you can see it looks really bumpy and it makes this iridescent color. But what they think, see, I'm saying they because they're not sure, but if we know, it's, it's we. But what they think is that these ants want to look, it's a way of mimicry. So they think that they might be looking like do. And it confuses predators as they run around. So a predator will see it, and it's this little dew running through, you know, it's the leaves. Dew, just they think, because well, that's it looks not like tasty. it's reflecting light in a way that Very might shiny. look like refracted, reflect like light water. Off of, off of mm -hmm. dew. That's like interesting. water. Yeah. You know, and you and bring beautiful. up there's that really interesting point of at some point when they discovered that, you know, some colors in animals and insects are from pigments, but then right. there's this entirely different way to have different colors that is more structural. It's just refraction from, yeah, the way that the way that the exoskeleton, or in the case of those shiny butterflies, they're really brown, but a butterfly's wing is covered in these scales that look like shingles. And if you look at them up close, um, they look like little jagged edges and stuff. And when the light hits them, it makes them look like those beautiful shiny colors. But Amazing. if you can put something on it to dampen the light, it looks like a brown wing. Eleanor. Brian. Ants don't have lungs, do they? How do ants breathe? No. Ants have, like many insects, like my insects, have these little holes all down their sides called spiracles. And the holes are connected to these tubes that run throughout their body and bathe their bodies in oxygen. So that's how they breathe. And then copper is the oxygen carrier in their hemolymph, which is what we call blood, which is, if you think about it, you know, it gets, when copper gets oxygenated, it turns green. So like our blood is red because it's iron. Yeah. And so they kind of yeah. have green blood, like greenish blood, like Vulcans. Yes, very similar. I'm sure that they, that all came from squashing caterpillars. 
Yes. That's amazing. Tell me something else on that level of how different they are. Because we, first of all, how fascinating that some species um, go through metamorphosis. Like from oh, caterpillar to butterfly, we can't relate to that at all. We can't. And ants we just go through bigger. metamorphosis. They yes. do. Ants. Right. So every ant you see that looks like an ant is a grown-up ant. Little ah. ants are not baby ants. Little ants are small species or species that are small. Yeah. And big ants are big ants. So... Another thing that's really cool about ants and, and honey, oh, here we go. Is so that... now we're looking at a picture of a baby ant and it looks like a beetle grub, but it's really furry and they couldn't figure out why there's little hairs. And if you see them moving around with their little white grains of rice through their nest, they don't look furry, but if you look at them up really close, they have these hairs on them and they couldn't figure out what the hairs did. So they gave them a haircut and apparently it makes them um, stand up. All, they just kept falling down. <laughs> <laughs> so they use oh, their hands so to be right it up. Yeah. Because it's really we, cute. Don't we have little hairs in our inner ear that have something to do with balance as well? Oh, I maybe mean, that is too, yeah. Maybe I that's kind of like a stretch, but yeah. um I think that was so, yeah, that was the last ant portrait. And yeah, um, so this is a carpenter ant and she's carrying uh her young and her young look like maggots, which that's what young ants look like. But when they emerge, they may look like adult ants but they haven't finished growing. So ants have, and bees have this thing that when they, when they emerge, they do different tasks in the nest as they emerge. So a newly emerged ant or bee will be a nursemaid and they'll feed their babies. That's what they do. And as they grow up, their jobs will change as they get older. And they found that not only do their jobs change, their brains change. So they have this part of an ant's brain called a mushroom body. And that's the part that's associated with their memory. And the more jobs they have to leave the nest and go foraging for food, the bigger their mushroom bodies get because they have to remember certain things like how to get back and stuff. So as they get older, they have more and more risky jobs. And then they just kind of, the oldest ants have the most risky jobs because they're like, okay, well, I guess we can just, you know, we're done with them. So, you know, the fighting and the foraging and stuff go to the oldest ants. So there's, there's our baby big baby. And Here's a pupae. Yeah. yeah. So some ants pupate in a cocoon. You can see a ba the baby ant, the, the larvae is the one that looks like a little maggot, the white, smooth looking, you know, grubby thing. And then this particular species of ant pupates in a silken cocoon. Like, like you, they, some of them spin silk and they pupate inside the cocoon. Some will pupate just hanging out in the open and just get taken care of. And they just look like you have little, you know, stuck creatures just hanging out with their legs and stuff. So this is a pupae. Yeah. And then you can see in the end, they cut open the pupae and there's the adult inside ready to come out. Yeah. Is that the, oh, yeah, that's. Oh. This is our final image. Oh, I love this ant. So this is a, this is an ant that every single person has seen, whether they know it or not. This, this individual, is a this specific ant. This ant. ant this, this, this is the one. She around. really gets around. God bless her. She is mm -hmm. busy. And this is a pavement ant. So pavement oh. ants are really cool. Over here, they're they're not native, but nobody really thinks of them as pests. Um, they're from Europe. And they love living in crags and um, cliffs, you know, real rocky areas. So what happened is when we started building our cities, we basically built cliff faces everywhere in the town. So our sidewalks are like, they're like cliffs, right? They're like just these really hard cement thing. Pavement ants live under our sidewalks. They love them. They're the ones that are carrying off your popcorn. When you drop it on the sidewalk, they live in the cracks. And Are they're they wonderful. Common, pretty common in New York and San Francisco, yes. where I used to live. I, I, I have heard, and they say, <laughs> they've done a study on this. I think they eat more of our trash than rats do in New York. Really? They, they're really, really good at removing our extra food. And they don't bother us. They have stingers, but they can't sting you because the stinger has been flattened so that they can spread out their trail pheromone better. And they tend aphids and they do all this stuff. And then once a year, about this time, they come out and they have these battle royales. And it's not against us. They just fight each other every year. And they 
you just see them tumbling all over the sidewalk. Have you ever seen this? I don't Dishes. think so. They rip each other up and they only smell different. They don't look different because they're the same species, but they can tell each other apart. They'll like one will get on three, will get on one and just rip their legs off. I mean, it's really, really gruesome if you were a size of an ant and you were like watching it and you felt sorry for it. But yeah. they go and they have these huge battles and they're territorial battles and then they quit they go back under the sidewalk and they don't fight for the rest of the year. Or they're like, okay, this is your square. This is my square. Let's not, let's not talk about this again. And then yeah. they're fine for the rest of the year. That's amazing. Okay. Um, there's a, a few comments came in. Um, Melissa said, I think you need to write a children's book about how an ant's job changes as they grow oh, up. Let's do that, Melissa. Let's do it. Um, Nadine asked, how long do ants usually live? Nadine, that's a really good question because uh, ants' lifespan is, oh, my eyes started to kind of itch. An ant's lifespan is based on her queen's lifespan, right? So an ant, a worker ant could live a few months, it could live a couple of years, but queens can live a really long time. So queens can live decades. They can live 50 years or more. It just depends on the species. It depends on how lucky they are, all of that. So there are these ants called acrobat ants that we have here and they, they have little heart shaped bottoms. They're wonderful. And <laughs> they are very common. They're really important. Um, they are the primary food source for red cockaded woodpeckers, which are an endangered species. They are um, primary protectors of these Miami blue butterflies, which are endangered species. They're really, really important. And when they release their queens to go mate and form a new colony, they have less than a 3% chance of making it. But if they can make it, that queen can live 30 years. It's so hard to imagine insects living that long. I had a friend. Know. You know why? Do you feel tarantula. bad about killing stuff now? Right. Because it's... you don't know how right. long they live. It may have had a long life ahead of it. Yeah. Or behind a, it. A it could have told of... you a few things, Brian. It, it, could, it had probably had stories to tell you. <laughs> but I don't and, speak its pheromone language, unfortunately. Oh, my God. You know what? There is an amazing short, short story that I think everyone should read. And it's by Ursula K. Le Guin, the late, great science fiction writer. I'm pretty sure. I'm almost certain it's Ursula K. Le Guin. And it's called The Author of the Acacia Seeds. And then it has a subtitle. It's like The Author of the Acacia Seeds. You can find it with that. Um, the Author of the Acacia Seeds and other a extracts from like a journal. And what it is, it's a few like fictitious entries from a science journal all about animal communication. Oh, and really cool. the the later um, there's a couple that are about penguins dancing or or something uh, something else but the first piece is called the author of the acacia seeds and this is an extremely short story and if you google it it's online I'm all right Amber it is the most amazing little story because it's imagine a journal report that is talking about these seeds that were found and about how they were translated, about the way the seeds were laid in a tunnel of an anthill, and about the extrusions, the chemical extrusions oh, on them. Oh, so cool. And then it translates, and it, it like, she imagines, like, what, and one of the things is, it's like, it's translated as, and she's like looking at the grammar and everything, and it seems to be translated as up with the queen. And it's not down with the queen, because down, down is good in the ant world. Mm -hmm. Up where the surface is is bad. Yeah. And so it's uh -huh. but it's it's weird. That's, that's just what I remember. The author of the acacia seeds, Ursula K. Le Guin. Google it. It's a ten minute read, maybe five, and it is a beautiful, amazing piece of science fiction. Highly recommend. All right, we're gonna do, do it. Do you? We'll have a book club. You know what? We're not gonna talk about woodpeckers today, and we're not gonna talk about spiders. But spiders, um, spiders, I always say we're going to come. We're going to have you back and we'll talk about some other stuff. Do you have a favorite aunt? I don't. You don't? I, I would like to have a favorite. Aunt. I do have one. Actually, I, I can I tell you about it. I wish it's you just would. wonderful, Brian. 
it's called a winnow ant and they are here they're all over the all over the united states and you can find them in different species of winnow ants around um and what they do is they plant seeds so when you're talking about the acacia seeds here they plant wildflowers and herbaceous seeds and they found that if you remove a winnow ant from the environment, the seeds, herbaceous um, abundance of diversity drops by as much as 50%. They're really, really important for keeping the forest floor healthy and the structure of the forest, but they're just beautiful and they're charming and they're wonderful to watch. They walk high up on their legs. And, you know, I didn't know about them until I was in graduate school and started studying ants, but I've been seeing them my whole life. And I didn't even think about it. You know, yeah. you, you see these things. And if you don't wonder about it, you're not going to know that we're, how much wonderful stuff we're surrounded by. You that's, know, that's one of the things I love about science and scientists. It's like scientists have really, maybe it's a generalization, but it's a great generalization, have maintained their childlike wonder with the world. And they continue to like, like Matt Bertone's a great example. He's, yeah, a he big, a he's a big man, and mm -hmm. he is such a kid when it comes to talking about insects. He gets yeah, so thing. excited about any species of insect that right. you bring up. But the thing is, like, you don't even have to be a scientist to, like, as a job to do this. Like, you can just be a person who's going to eat at lunch outside today because you don't really want to hang out with your coworkers. And you'll find that you are surrounded by the most magical, incredible world. And if you spend two seconds watching them, you'll start to understand them. Like, sure, you can't smell their chemicals, but you can watch them communicate with each other and get a pretty good idea of what they're saying. And it's not just ants, it's everything. And you take a second to wonder about it, and then you'll see how amazing this world is. It's just I incredible. Know. I love little things when science is right under your nose. And one of the examples I think of is like, I've had a book like those, um, your mom, you may have at some point bought some of those glow in the dark stickers to stick on the wall or ceiling of your children's room or a book cover that has it. It's like phosphorescent or yeah. fluorescent. I don't, I, I don't know the correct word, but the thing glow is glow in the dark like for, yeah, glow in the dark. You go for a couple bucks you buy these things and you turn the lights on and when you turn them off, they're glowing. Well, so on one level, that's all it is, but it's actually to understand what's going on. There's it's quantum physics. And it's like, there is mm -hmm. deep science going on that ends up in this $2 package of, of glow in the dark stickers and, right. and that effect or your watch dial or anything else yeah. like that. Yeah. I'm fascinated yeah. by that. And you know what? Fred came through for us with, it's called The Author of the Acacia Seeds and Other Extracts from the Journal of the Association of Ferrolinguistics. Fred, I'm glad that he described it before you did because <laughs> honestly, I don't so think I would really, have picked that up. But, I mean, like I said, it's as if it's a journal. Or, you know, it's that kind of science fiction right? where it's proposed, like, here's an actual journal article from a futuristic, like, a, a journal right. that studies that ferrolinguistics. I don't know that thorough means but this was about language in other species so right uh somehow ties to that um you look like you have something like is there anything no i'm listening hmm? that i that we've that that just randomly that you've thought in the past hour that that i well there's off and you one thing say, that yeah. you didn't touch on um when you were talking about the ants in your kitchen that we need to settle would you okay. like to tell people what you think the ants in your kitchen smell like, Brian Mallow? Yeah, yeah. So I learned a little something about this. It turns out probably those ants that are coming in, they don't they don't bite. Um, and but now we got to say there's a difference between getting stung and bitten, right? Right. So the stinger is what hurts. You don't get bitten by a bee and you don't get bitten by an ant. You get Stung. That's the part that hurts because that's where they inject the venom into your body. So a lot of people say I have ant bites and they don't. Um, so no, but these ants, they could, they could bite you, but you wouldn't feel it. I mean, they just have teeny tiny mouths. Are there but any these ants, ants that you're that... thinking of don't have stingers. Hmm? 
Okay, there's no ants that their bite is bad. It's just, it's a sting. No, I mean, you know, that fire ants me. are real jerks. I mean, fire ants will bite you and they use that bite so that you can't brush them off while they sting you sting in you. a circle around the bite. Yeah. Wow. That kind of reminds me of the, of the often, uh, the confusion over poisonous versus venomous. Yes. People always think of poisonous It's one of snakes. those things that very few venomous. people really care about, but the people who care about it care about it deeply. Yes. So you might as well just go for it. So you don't yeah. say so it, like ants that are venomous, venomous snakes. because it, you, yeah, it's the method of, of, of receiving it. So yes, they That's put it venomous. in your body. They're but venomous a snake, in your body. If, if you say a snake is poisonous, you're saying like if you eat it, it's poisonous. If you but eat if it, it, if it it's bites problem. you and injects venom, that's venomous. Poisonous right. is when we eat, we consume it and it's poisonous. Or it just comes in your thing. Yeah, that's right. Thanks um, for clearing that up. So, so these don't. The ones in your kitchen, that doesn't matter at all because they don't do either. So um, let me do, let's do a little bookkeeping right here. Um, where, because I do want to say that um, my opening theme song uh, is by Logan Whitehurst, and you can find him at loganwhitehurst.com, and also um, his artist page on Spotify. I'll put those links in the video descriptions later, but loganwhitehurst.com, the song is called Buckaroo Banzai is not just a movie. Uh, anyway, Logan Whitehurst, Logan Whitehurst, Logan Whitehurst, do check him out. And um, so for you, also, I just want to remind everybody that uh, your this is your newest book that's out is Ants Workers of the World with those amazing yes. photos by uh, Edward Nigga and and yes. your text all about these ants. Right. Um. Previously, you've written Dr. Eleanor's Book of Common Ants with Rob Dunn. And, oops, let's keep that. And also Common Ants of New York City from Dr. Eleanor. And on a future episode of But Seriously, we'll be talking about spiders. Uh, do you want to intrigue us with just some little uh, spider thing? Sure. So people say this is a legend. Then they say, I Googled it, and it's a legend. <laughs> but I have some good authority because the guy who did the study is the guy who wrote the book with me to tell you that you are never more than four feet from a spider. You're never That's more all. than four feet from a spider. And um, so he did, did a write? lot of population density stuff. His name is who Chris you... Buttle. He's an arachnologist. And right now he's uh, what? He's in right. I think I met him at your house once a bunch of years ago. Where does he probably he did? Yeah, he was. He's there wonderful. was a little get together because he was in town. Yes, because he he deserves a party. He's a wonderful person. He's an and excellent he's, communicator, great arachnologist. But now he he's an administrator. Uh, McGill. Oh, in uh, Toronto, Montreal, Montreal, in Canada, mm -hmm. <laughs> up there. <laughs> that area. Oh wait, Melissa, what was that for? Sometimes people make an expression, and you're like, "Which which part was spider that for? Thing. Was that because of oh because I'll bet it's because there's a spider spiders. right now." Yeah, I mean, I find a lot of spiders here. I usually take pictures of them and I send them to Matt Bertone, and he'll oh, yeah. say, "Oh, that's a cellar spider." And well, you know, but it's Matt in my kitchen. and I have a project that Matt does most of the work on, where if you think you have a brown recluse in your house, you can take a picture of it and tweet it to recluse or not. And Matt or Catherine Scott will tell you if it's a recluse or not. Yeah, yes. the four feet from his fire thing. So yeah, he did a lot of, Chris did a lot of Buttle, the arachnologist, did a lot of population density things, even up in the Arctic. And even there, he found that you're never more than four feet from the spider. You know, the permafrost. I recently found a spider in my house and it only had seven legs. Do you think it was a new species? Oh, that's like a four-leaf plover. Did you keep that one? That's the lucky one. <laughs> I had, yeah, I had to remove some more had... legs so it couldn't get away. No, I'm I'm not that a spider at in uh, the ant lab, and some ants broke into the um, hit, hit her cage and ate off all but two of her legs, and she molted, and they all came back. You know, she regrew all of her legs. We won't go into this completely, but we did mention this project 
that uh, NC State and Rob Dunn and the North Carolina Museum right. of Natural Sciences, it was called Arthropods mm-hmm. in Our Home, uh, Michelle Trowine and, and Matt uh, worked on it and many others. Um, Tara mm-hmm. worked on it some as well. She did. And you uh-huh. know what? They went into 50, they started, it, it's, it's gone beyond this, um, but they started with 50 homes in the, the Raleigh area, and my house was one of the 50. And oh. in those 50 homes, they surveyed all the insects they could find in the house, and they also checked basements. And in those 50 homes, they found one black widow spider. They're, they're native <laughs> here, but they're not, I mean, they found one, and you know where they found it? In my oh, basement. Oh, it's yours. That was your spider. And a Did lot of what her? they find are dead bugs. And then uh, the live ones, they don't really care. But that one, Matt brought it back to the museum and reared it until it until it passed away. But um, it, unfortunately, it didn't last that long. But uh, but he took it. That's so funny. It's like he finds a black widow yeah. spider. What do you do? Bring it to the lab and keep it as a pet. or Just Keep or it on. It. And photograph Black widows are so cool. You know when black widows mate? Um, the females will lay her mating pheromones, since we were talking about pheromones, in her little cobwebby web. So a big, strong web with, will have a lot of pheromone in it, right? So you know what her needy boyfriends will do? The first one that shows up will start winding up the web to make her look sickly so the other ones won't come. Huh. They're like those boyfriends are like, oh, don't worry. You're fine. I love you. Nobody else does, but I, I'll love you. Yeah. yeah, there's such elaborate behaviors. I'm just everything that is categorized under instinct, like migration, mm-hmm. and even simple things like how does a baby know to go for the breast? Right. Like whether it's a human or a dog, it's just like they just know. Yeah. And it's, it's there's amazing. something so so amazing about it. So um, music Eleanor, is amazing to me, like that. What what is music is. The, I mean, we all have the beat, you know, we all some of us more beat, than others. We're, yes. I, I don't know if you've ever, you've never seen my aunt Jane clap along to something. Yeah. But, um, but, you know, but we do feel a beat. All of us do, you know, we all understand I am that pentameter, we're, that's the, that heartbeat, whether we know it or not, we have this feeling for it. You know, it's so cool yeah. to me. You remind me, I can't think of the researcher's name, but do you remember several years ago, there was a lot of talk about a particular, it it might've been a cockatoo or a cockatiel, I'm not sure, but it was called Snowball. And there had been videos of it dancing to songs like Another One Bites the Dust and other songs. Mm -hmm. And you can find a lot of videos like that on YouTube, but what this researcher was looking at was, it really seemed like it was on the beat. And that's what they yeah. wanted to determine. They did studies to see because it was thought that only humans could do this. And oh, I forget I what the that. conclusions were. I mean, it's like, is it really jamming to the beat? Is it taking cues from its owner off screen? Um, right. There's a lot to, it's not as simple as, well, but I mean, when you watch it, you go, it has about as much rhythm as a lot of humans I know. Right, at, at yeah. Least. yeah. Um, maybe, hey, maybe we got, uh, Jane. oops, Melissa says, I found uh, a black widow in my garage once in a box. I put the lid on it and ignored it for months, came back, it was still alive. Then my house burned down and it's a little dark, but I was like, I win. <laughs> <laughs> that's an elaborate, <laughs> boy, that's like, <laughs> that's called a Pyrrhic <laughs> victory. I yeah. think it's like, did anybody yeah. win that one? Um, that's an extreme to go to for a little spider that you could step on even. Um, but yeah, so spiders can live a long time. And even without, like my friend had a tarantula for 17 years or so. And, um, you know, you don't feed it very often. It's I kind think of amazing. Uh, Southern house spiders can go for like 12 years or something. Some crazy amount of time without eating. 12 years without very, eating, what is it used? Well, I don't know. I'll yeah. have to look that Maybe up. I haven't yeah. thought about that in a long time. Well, Eleanor, there's so much. Yeah. You're really fun to talk to. And we didn't even get into some things we discussed, other topics, science communication. So, but that's great. This we'll will be the to. Ant Show. This um, is the Ant Show. And we'll come back. My dog has come to, to say hello. Let's see. Um, but we can come back. Did you see that nose? 
Come here, lady. Yep, Can saw the nose. Hello? Let's see a little more. Oh. Can you see? Oh, there she is. She says hello. There she is. Can you see that way? Who is that and what she kind of very, dog? This is Lucy. She's a doodle. She is very, very, we had to cut all her hair off. And now that she can see, she it's a whole new world to her. She had all her hair growing in her face. Well, so. Eleanor, this was so much fun. And let's do this. Don't hang up. But uh, okay. let's get rid of the audience now. And Bye, we'll guys. say goodbye. This is Thank fantastic. Thank you for taking time for us today. Yeah. So I really enjoy talking to you. Where can, so like, you know, we had this up before. So on, I know you that your Instagram, you're pushing, but because yeah, you, so you have What I do, the reason I'm, I, I want people, if you do follow Instagram, what I'm doing is now, especially now that spring is coming around, is I'm finding stuff out in the world and I'm showing you what it is. So a lot of it is pigeons because I, I keep pigeons. And so you'll learn a lot about pigeons. But you'll also learn about insects that we find around us and what they're doing there. And if you have questions, you can send them to Instagram and I'll answer them for you if I know the answers. So your E Spice of Rice on Instagram. Instagram. Yeah. And you know, well, yeah, as Melissa and some other uh, fans of mine know that we have that that pigeon or dove thing in common because yes, you've we had do. roosting pigeons. I've had roosting morning doves. Not the past, right. not last year and this year, but I'm hoping they come back because there were like three or four years in a row, more than one roost per season. Yeah. There were some disasters. It happened. And I think that's why they don't come back. I think they start, they show up and they're like, maybe we should build a nest here. And I think some I other bird vibe. comes along and goes, but have you heard about the murders? Yeah, it's a bad vibe. But don't Crows. Worry. Crows. Yeah, they're the caught worst. on video. Like they but were they're the a best suspect. Too. I know. Save they're so it, smart. Brian. And... Save it. I know. You it's know what? The I... Dove saga. I wonder. We will save it. But I wonder. I had this because of how brutally the last one ended. Um. What if I could befriend the fro crows? What if I could feed them and get them to understand that these particular babies, if we ever have any again, are off limits, but I'll give you plenty of food. Just leave these alone. Leave these. These are friends. I'll give How you all you the pick? food you want. You just come get a bunch of dead squirrels from the road and throw them in your yard every day for them. I mean, crows I, mean, I was thinking starting with seeds stuff. and think, I know it's hard to compare with something as juicy when you, you have don't to really see a crow babies. at the feeder. You see them on like roadkill and oh, you know. really, but they eat this other stuff too. I looked up what some of their favorite foods are and it's not all animals here's the thing crows can learn english and they can speak english or any language so what you should do is start, if you, you have some time crows can you talk? should start yeah crows can talk did you know that and they can remember your face and they hold grudges and they can pass their grudges from generation to generation i've heard of that stuff but this talking was new to me maybe they don't want us to know so they don't do it much in front of no, us no they can learn they can like parrot things they're really okay. really smart but I think what you would get is a murder of crows living in your yard, yeah, coming to eat all your junk. So I mean, that's that's the thing. It's like I might be making it. I know. Yard. Am I calling attention to them, or is there a way we could be friends and go? Let's include these in our family. You can go eat all the other baby doves you want, just not these. Just not just my not doves. These. No, we could just take my baby pigeons and put them in your dove nests. And Do so doves that. regurgitate? Do they make milk? Pigeons make um, milk for their babies. Well, I mean, I don't, yeah. I mean, I'm not clear what the difference between a pigeon and a dove is, but that's for another time. Fine. We'll talk about it later. We Y'all, we got to go, but we'll talk soon. So, Eleanor Spicer Rice, where can they find you besides E Spicer Rice on Instagram? I'm on Twitter on a different handle. It's at Verdant, Verdant Eleanor. Yeah, Green. D E R D A N T. Verdant. Eleanor. Ant. Verdant. It you can has tell I don't really it. have a marketing person coming it up. Has with my in it has ants in it. It does. Verdant, Eleanor. <laughs> that was totally on purpose. Totally. That's exactly how it was. And so uh, this has been fun. Let's wrap it up. Don't go away. But um, thank you all for tuning in. Thanks for your great thank comments. You. Fred, I don't understand half your comments. Harmonics? Does that relate to something we talked about? I don't know. I'm sorry I didn't get to all of your comments, Fred, but uh, but he did say, oh, that's so big. Theoretical linguistics. 
Craig, you're good with the internet. All right, let, let's lose that one. And he said, YouTube Montina. I see half his thank comments you, I don't understand, but thank you, Fred. Um, thanks for tuning in. I'm going to be doing more and more of these and, um, we have at least one coming up next week with Matt Bertone. He's an insect He's photographer great. and entomologist. So we'll be looking at some amazing photos that he takes. And he and really very knowledgeable. has something. Yeah, he's got something to say about any insect you mention. And it's very fun and exciting, like talking to you. Oh, well, thank you. But he's so, a way, he's, he is one of the most knowledgeable people, knowledgeable I, people yeah. I've ever met. So thank you, Dr. Eleanor Spicer Rice. Thank Check you. out her books, Dr. Eleanor's Book of Common Ants and Book of Common Spiders and and work, uh, ants, workers, workers of, of the world. world. Um, they're yeah. all available in places where you get books. Yes, yeah, they are. And so let's sign off and uh, we can roll our little, uh, our, our, roll, our, our, our song by Logan Whitehurst and our closing title there. And we'll see you next time. Ah!